So if you and I were in a New England tavern 247 years ago, Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, I think you're going to really enjoy our chat today. You can just sit back, and relax, even close your eyes if you want, and just listen. I've got lots of fun stories to share with you today, but if at any time you want to jump ahead, be sure to check the chapter timestamps in the description and in the pinned comment underneath this video. So if we were in a New England tavern here in the United States 247 years ago, we would certainly be enjoying some refreshing beverages, but most importantly, we'd probably be sharing some really great stories, and that's what I want to share with you today. First, I want to wish my sweet friends here in the United States an early but very happy Independence Day. But to my sweet friends across the pond, I want to wish you a very happy, healthy, and blessed month of July. And in the spirit of our enduring friendship between our two countries, Today I would like to share with you some quintessentially American recipes along with some quintessentially British recipes. So what refreshing beverages might we be enjoying if we were in a New England tavern today? Well, in the past I've shared two fun ones with you. One called a shrub and the other called a switchel. They have funny names, but they're both really tasty. And I'll be sure to link in the description to all the recipes that I mention in this video. A switchel, which is also sometimes called haymaker's punch, is very easy to make. It combines water, vinegar, and a little sweetener. It's really the old-fashioned version of what we might consider today the original electrolyte drink. So whether you're in a tavern, or if you're out gardening, or even if you want to have some mocktails, some non-alcoholic beverages to serve your guests during a barbecue, a switchel is always a welcome treat. A shrub is also delicious and very easy to make. You pummel up some fruit, you make a little puree, you mix it with some sparkling water and maybe a couple of little herbs to really pump up the flavor, and you've got another very refreshing beverage. But if we want a little snack to enjoy with our beverages, we really have to turn to some wonderful British treats. When my husband and son and I were in London, we went to the Imperial War Museum. First, let me just say it's a fantastic museum. But what I especially loved about it is they have a cafeteria. And I will say in all honesty, I enjoyed some of the best scones there that I have ever had. Well, when I got home to the U.S., I contacted some of my friends across the pond, some of my friends in England, and I asked them to share with me their recipes for how to make scones. And one of them really stood out as a fantastic recipe, and I share it with you in a video along with a printable recipe. And the scones are so good, and they're pretty close to the ones that I enjoyed in London. And no scone would be complete without clotted cream, which I also received a recipe from my friends across the pond. And I have a recipe for that to also share with you. And of course, with the clotted cream, you've got to make some homemade jam. And I share that with you as well, because there's nothing like a scone with clotted cream and jam on it. But do you put the jam on first or do you put the clotted cream on first? I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. And coming back to this side of the pond, here in the United States, if you're looking for a fun dessert to make that dates back to the 1700s, you can't go wrong with an apple pan dowdy. It was Abigail Adams' favorite dessert. Abigail Adams was one of the first ladies here in the United States. She was married to John Adams, who was the second president of the United States. And I highly recommend looking up Abigail Adams if you're not familiar with her. She was quite a lady. 
And if you'd like to try her recipe for apple pan daddy, I've got that for you and I'll link to it below. Well, moving on from food, I want to share something with you that I think my friends across the pond, my sweet friends, will really appreciate. But I want to share with you that my great-grandmother, Alice, was British. If you've not had a chance to enjoy the movie Enchanted April, I highly recommend it. And I especially enjoyed it because to a certain extent, it made me think of what life may have been like for my great-grandmother. Well, my great-grandmother, Alice, ventured to northern Italy for a summer vacation. Now, mind you, this was in the 1800s. Well, Alice, along with her mother and father, ventured to the province of Lombardy in northern Italy. And there, while vacationing, who did she meet? She met my great-grandfather. His name was Eugene, and the two of them fell in love. So Alice received permission from her mother and father to marry my grandfather, and she settled in northern Italy with him. They eventually went on to have three children, two girls and one boy. The boy, Mario, is my grandfather. And Mario, having a mother who was from England and spoke English, grew up speaking both Italian and English, among other languages. He was quite something. Well, Mario eventually went on to work for an American businessman who also had been traveling through Italy. And when the businessman retired, he still wanted my grandfather to stay in his service as his secretary. And it wasn't uncommon back then for businessmen to have a male secretary, especially when they had to travel. It would have been quite the folder hall, so to speak, if a married man was traveling with a single lady as his secretary. So when this businessman retired, he settled here in the United States, being an American, and he had my grandfather join him. Eventually, my grandmother, his wife, Louise was able to join him and she traveled by herself, which I think is very brave, with two of her children. She went on to have more children here in the United States, but she and her two children, she had twin daughters, uh, traveled to the United States where they settled in the New York area. This is in the early 1900s and my grandmother and grandfather were so proud to be able to become Americans and they loved living here. And my grandmother, really along with most of my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, were so proud to be Americans, to be first-generation Americans. My mother-in-law is also a first-generation American, and she's very proud to be an American citizen. And that is something I've really been able to learn from my great-grandparents, my grandparents, as well as my mother-in-law, how precious it is to them to be first-generation Americans. Sometimes those of us who are born here kind of take it for granted and we don't realize how fortunate we are. But to listen to their stories about where they came from and the struggles that they were able to overcome by relocating to the United States is really lovely to hear, and it warms my heart. Of course, no country is perfect, and all countries have had their problems throughout the ages, but it is really a blessing to have been born here in the United States and to have grown up here. And I feel that's been very affirmed to me uh, by my grandparents as well as by my mother-in-law. And I remember feeling so proud to be an American during the bicentennial, 1976. And something that I think is very cute is that gas stations, sometimes grocery stores, different businesses would often give you various types of gifts during the bicentennial. And this is something that really continued. Even fast food restaurants in the future would have various little giveaways if you spent a certain amount of money or whatever the case may be. And these glasses were very popular. 
they may have been, I have to really search my memory, they may have been uh, glasses that you either got at the grocery store or the gas station. I can't remember exactly. But how beautiful. Glass, not plastic, and with beautiful pictures. They've got the Liberty Bell on the front and the Declaration of Independence on one side. And then if you are looking into the glass, there are different pictures. One is the spirit of 76, and the other is, I believe that's the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Very cute. And so these are very special uh, little glasses to, to still have. And it was such a wonderful celebration. I was very late into my teen years. And I remember, as I've shared with you, I grew up in New York and lived in New York. And in New York, the bicentennial celebration was really fantastic. And what was so lovely about it was that they had something called the tall ships. And these were old fashioned ships that sailed into New York Harbor from all over the world. And it was such a sight to see, to see all these beautiful ships with all the rigging, all from, you know, different countries and at night doing the fireworks. And it was just magnificent. And the ships were amazing. And so that was really something very special to have lived through. Now, it's been 247 years since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So we're just around the corner from 250 years. So I hope that there will be a lovely celebration planned throughout the country that we can really enjoy and really sort of reignite our patriotism. So hopefully that'll be something that'll be a lot of fun to look forward to. So even though here in the United States we did win our independence from England, it does warm my heart knowing that we have had an enduring friendship through the years, especially since my great-grandmother was British. And I'm sure it makes her very happy as she looks down from heaven knowing the good relationship that our countries share. Well, I want to share a story with you from the American Revolutionary period. But it's not so much about a battle as it is about a dog. If you've read this book, General Howe's Dog, he was a British general, you know the story. And some of you, even if you've not read this book, may already know the story. Because there's also a children's version of this, and it may have been read to you as a child, or depending on where you live, whether in England or here in the United States, you may also know the story just by the fact that it has been told to you. But I think by now you all know I love dogs. And I love stories about dogs, especially stories like this that really pull on your heartstrings. During a battle between the British and the colonists, General Howe's dog got lost. And when he got lost, what happened to him? He crossed enemy lines. Well, when the colonists, the Americans-to-be, so to speak, found him, when the American or colonial soldiers found him, they saw some type of identification on him that he belonged to General Howe. Now, it's important to note that General Washington also had dogs and loved dogs. Well, General Washington instructed his soldiers to return the dog to General Howe. And this meant that they would have to cross over into enemy lines. So in crossing into enemy lines, they would need to make it clear to the British troops that they were wanting to come in peace. So my husband, who's the much better historian than me, tells me that the terminology for how they crossed into enemy lines was to wave the flag of parley, to mean a ceasefire. So the colonial soldiers are telling the British soldiers, okay, we need a little truce, we need to talk. So the British soldiers allowed the colonial soldiers to cross enemy lines 
And who do they present, who do the colonial soldiers present to the British soldiers but General Howe's dog? So the British troops accepted the dog, very happily, I'm guessing, <laughs> and thanked the colonial troops, I'm guessing, <laughs> and allowed them to return back to their own lines as the British soldiers then went on to uh, bring the dog to General Howe, who you can imagine, anyone who's a dog lover, and I suspect just like General Washington, General Howe too was a dog lover, and must have been very happy to receive his dog back. And it's my understanding that this act of kindness on the part of General Washington was even covered in British newspapers at the time. So it helped to see General Washington in maybe a little softer light. So if you love a good dog story, I highly recommend General Howe's Dog by Caroline Tiger, his <laughs> cute last name. And they also have children's versions of this story as well, which I also highly recommend. And I've read many a time to my son. Moving on from books, I want to share the name of a television series with you that you might remember and that you can probably actually still find here on YouTube. It's actually a children's series, but I so enjoyed it with my son as well. It was called Liberty Kids, and it was a very cute story about three children living in colonial America and working for Benjamin Franklin. The children have a lot of adventures, and through their adventures, uh, teach us about that period in history. And they make it very fun and very entertaining. And I just think it's wonderful because often today, you know, sometimes you see these men on the street interviews and sometimes it can be a little shocking how uh, many young adults today, maybe even older adults as well, don't always know their history. And when asked these various questions, whether it's about the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution or moving on to who the presidents were uh, it, throughout history, from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln and so on and so forth, people are often somewhat stumped. And I highly recommend looking up the TV show. I believe it was, you know, on PBS or you know, something like that. Uh, it was just a wonderful show, and it's a wonderful way, sort of an easy way, uh, to learn American history. And it's kind of interesting because I once remember reading about a woman who wrote romance novels, and they were set uh, in different times in history. And she would also often turn to children's books to learn about those particular times in history because it can be very basic, very straightforward, and give you the answers that you need and give you a feel for that particular time in history. And that's exactly how I found Liberty Kids to be. It was entertaining, it was fun, but it also taught you a little bit about uh, the history and the period of colonial America. Something that I found really enjoyable, and I developed this, I guess you could say, hobby or habit from my mom, who also enjoyed it. But I have always enjoyed learning about history, and specifically since we're talking about American history today, uh, that's what I will share with you. But it's often the way that I enjoyed learning about world history. But when it comes to learning about history, and American history specifically, I have always enjoyed learning about it from the perspective of American women. And I've enjoyed learning about it by reading about the various first ladies of our country. And two ladies that I enjoy reading about the most are probably Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison. And I'm always impressed at how really throughout history, there have been so many wonderful women, so many courageous women, so many interesting women. And so I enjoyed learning a lot of my early American history, history reading about Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison. And I would often start 
<laughs> very much like my mom did, reading cookbooks that talked about them and that talked about their recipes, but also gave a lot of glimpses into their lives. So that can also be a very fun way to learn about American history, reading about women throughout our history and all of the various accomplishments they made, the different things they did, even sometimes when it's just as simple as reading about the foods they enjoyed. Everything that we learn gives us a little glimpse into those particular time periods throughout our history. And it also gives, what would you call it, almost I think sometimes uh, when my husband and I and our son play board games, they talk about, if I'm using this terminology correctly, the flavor text. I almost feel that, yes, there's the basic history that we learn in school, the dates and the names of different things, but it's when you read about people's lives and the things they liked and the things they did, the very new, the various nuances of their life, it really adds a lot of flavor to what you're learning uh, about history, about historical facts. It brings it almost to life. That's why I've also, something I've always enjoyed is reading historical fiction, that it's set in a time period there are real facts that are weaved throughout the story, uh, but the characters really bring that history, bring those facts to life. Well, as we approach Independence Day here in the United States, I hope you'll lift your glass in a toast and enjoy a switchel or a shrub. And to honor our friends, our sweet friends across the pond, I hope you'll bake some scones and maybe enjoy some clotted cream and some jam with them. And if you'd like any of those recipes, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a playlist with all of those and more. And I look forward to seeing you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love, God bless, and happy Independence Day.